There are no wrong needs. All needs are right desires. One never needs anything that is bad for one or ever needs anything in excess. You can, only, you can want more than is good for you. You can want things that happen to be bad for you. There are wrong wants and right ones. I equally quarrel with that. There are less than a dozen natural needs and less than a dozen real goods. Very small number. Would you list them, please? Food, certainly. Drink, certainly. And sleep, certainly. I am not sure that sex, I am not sure that sex, I'm not sure that sexual deprivation is as serious as the deprivation. I really mean this quite seriously. I don't mean to be jocular. I don't think that sexual deprivation is as much of a, uh, shall I say, destructive of human beings as the lack of food, the lack of drink, and the lack of sleep. These are the things that kill a man. Deprivation of sex do not. A good life is a life so led that in the course of it, one has attained and accumulated all the things that are really good for a man or woman to have. Do you think you're likely to get these uh, 14 disparate people to agree on the meaning of the good? I haven't the faintest hope for that. For goodness sake, you might ask, what is Mortimer Adler talking about? His answer, as usual, is a question. What does goodness mean when you think about it? Think, says Mortimer Adler, thinking about the great ideas is good for you, especially the idea of goodness. Every summer, they come from distant places to the Aspen Institute in Colorado. The Institute's controlling principle is that you're never too old or too official to learn. Scholars, business executives, judges, journalists, educators, public officials, as well as citizens without titles who come with open minds willing to joust with the opinions of others. From the United Nations University in Tokyo, from the British Academy in London, and from the University of Texas in Austin, they may be late, but never lazy. Mortimer Adler won't allow it. Adler's seminars at the institute he helped to start are exacting, exhausting, often exasperating, but never boring. Ideas are his passion. He's chairman of the board of editors of the Encyclopedia Britannica, director of the Institute for Philosophical Research in Chicago, and one of America's most prolific entrepreneurs of ideas. His latest book is called Six Great Ideas. One of those ideas is goodness, the subject of today's seminar and of this film. Goodness, it's not what you think. In just the time we've been together, I've heard people around here talk of good weather, good wine, good coffee, a good time, a good reason, a good memory, a good man, a good woman. I've heard them talk about being good, feeling good and doing good. When you hear that word good used that frequently, what goes through your mind? Well, I, I divide all those uses into two large groups. One is the moral use of the word good. When you say a good man or a good woman, I think you're making a moral judgment about the character of the person and the kind of life he or she leads and the kind of acts he or she performs. When you talk about good weather, good wine, good coffee, good time. Um, the word good is used in what I'm going to call a grading sense. Coffee experts, for example, take bins of coffee and say good, better, best, and eliminate something that's not good at all. In every field of, of commerce, there are experts who grade the, the commodities according to their, their, the grades of excellence or uh, perfection that they have. For that use of the word good, you could substitute the word fine, finer, finest, and it would mean exactly the same thing. It's not a moral sense. Not a moral sense at all. It's a, it's a, a judgment about the excellence of the thing you're talking about. When you use the word goodness as one of the six great ideas, in what sense are you using it? I'm using the word goodness in the moral sense of what it is good for human beings. Good for them, it makes them good men and women, makes their lives good lives or bad lives. Isn't it true that what is good for you is not necessarily good for me? There, there are most of the things we call good or bad are, uh, correspond 
to the things we like or dislike. And matters I, of taste. Matters of taste. If I like fish, and I say, I, I like fish, and I, I find it good, and you say, I like meat, that's a, a difference of opinion that's not arguable. You, the reason why you shouldn't, I, I don't have to say to you, Bill, you ought to like meat, I like meat, and you ought to like meat. That's a nonsensical statement. Almost. No, there's no meaning to the ought there. But if I said to you, Bill, I think you're wasting your time. You aren't trying to get more knowledge. You're playing, playing most of your time. You're indulging in all kinds of sports and activities that are improving your mind. I think you ought to spend more time learning. There's an ought. Ought, which means? I'm saying that you, when I say ought, whenever I use the word ought, I'm referring to a basic need that I think you are morally obliged to fulfill. But how, when you say you ought to do this or you ought to do that, can you prove the truth or falsity of that statement in regard to my need? How do you know my need? Well, I, I don't know your need individually, Bill. I know, I know the needs that are common to all, all human beings. The only way that I can talk about, make any moral judgments that have universal validity is if the needs I'm talking about are common to all human beings, we have an animal part of our nature and we have animal needs, bio, what we call biological needs, the needs for food and drink and sleep. Uh, take those three for a moment. Uh, they are life-sustaining. And in, insofar as I would say that life is a fundamental, a fundamental good for, for a living thing, we need the things that sustain life. And every human being needs them, every human being. Not just you and I, not just Americans, not just Frenchmen, not just uh, Asiatics, all human beings, everywhere at all times. Now you say, are there, are there needs that point to real goods beyond the biological level? Yes. I think man is by nature a political animal, and therefore uh, being a citizen, having, having suffrage, having a voice in his own government, is a real good and meets the need of a political animal. I think man has, by nature, freedom of choice, and he therefore needs freedom of action. Because if he had freedom of choice and did not have freedom of action, the freedom of choice would be nugatory. You couldn't carry out your choices, you see. So that our right to liberty, our right to liberty is based upon our need for that freedom of action, which is the liberty we're concerned with, in order to realize, fulfill the freedom of choice, the choices we make freely. But the communists would say to that, you're not speaking for what is a basic need in our society because as long as we meet the basic biological needs of people, uh, the other needs are, are relative to your would, own society. I would say they're wrong. I, I, have to, I have to say, I think the communist failure to recognize the human need for freedom, uh, political freedom and individual freedom of action, is an error on the part of the totalitarian state. You're saying then that some things are good for us regardless of what people think about them. Precisely. I'm saying there are some moral truths, not everything. The one man's meat is another man's poison is quite right. Your, your fish and my meat, okay. But uh, uh, for a small number of real goods, very small number, I'd say less than a dozen, I can make, I think, moral judgments about what human beings ought to seek and ought to do that I think can be shown to be true and true for all men everywhere. You said real goods. Real goods. As opposed to... Apparent good. Now, the difference is that an apparent good is something you call good because you want it or like it. It is good because you want it. In the case of real goods, your need for you, what you need, the, the good itself is that which you need. It corresponds to a need. You need it because you're human. That's right. Give me an example. Well, I would say when I say I like, I like vanilla ice cream, and I think it's good, I, I call it good because I like it, uh, that's an apparent good. Uh, I, I dislike I dislike pistachio. And I, I don't like it and I don't call it good. But if I say, uh, I, I desire as much knowledge as I can get, and I'm going to make every effort to get as much knowledge as I can, I'm talking about a good that I, I feel obliged, under obligation to pursue, to seek, to acquire. Because I think it's really good for me because it fulfills a basic human need that I have. All the real goods are goods that we are obliged to seek, to desire, reach out for, because they satisfy our fundamental needs, fulfill our potentialities. But not all of us feel obliged to seek knowledge. I didn't say that everyone feels obliged. I'd say they ought to seek knowledge, and the obligation is upon them that I would, if I make the moral judgment, every human being should seek knowledge, I can defend that judgment. Defend it. Well, a moral judgment can't be true 
in the way in which a, a statistical statement or a scientific statement is true. When we've talked about truth, you and I, Bill, we said that the truth of such descriptive truths are true because in that case, what the mind thinks conforms to the way things are to reality. That mountain is 6,000 feet high, we can prove that. That's right. Either is or is not, Satan is either true or false descriptively, right? But when I say you ought to seek knowledge, I, there's no conformity between my statement, ought and reality. There are no oughts, ought, nots in reality. Uh, the only philosopher who ever solved the problem of how to make prescriptive judgments, how to explain the truth or falsity of prescript prescriptive was Aristotle. And in one paragraph he says, on the one hand, our theoretical statements, our descriptive statements are true by the agreement of the mind with reality. But when we say ought or ought not, when we make prescriptive judgments, the truth lies in conformity to right desire. I puzzled about that for a long time. And well, that'd be fine if I knew what right desire is. Now, what's right desire? Well, right desire is what I ought to desire. Well, what ought I to desire? And then I found the answer. I ought to desire what I need. Because when you think of the word need, what you mean by need, can you, have you ever thought of something and said, well, that man has a wrong need? Wrong wants, I understand. I, mean, I can point to lots of people who think want the wrong thing. But can a person need something? Can a person need by nature something as bad for his nature? I think not. Every need is a right desire for something that's really good for the person that needs it. And since we all have the same human nature and our potentialities are the same, our inherent natural needs are the same, uh, that is the basis of our moral judgments. All right, let, let's see if we can make this more concrete for people by playing fill in the blank. All right. And I will call out the blank and you fill it in right. with only what you consider to be those needs all of us need because we're human. Right. All right. Men and women need food because they're human, human animals. Men and women need uh, friends because they're social animals. They need to associate with their fellow human beings. Men and women need liberty because by nature they have free choice and they need liberty of action in order to execute their free choice. Men and women need knowledge because, because they have minds that are empty, just as their stomachs are empty, and that those minds crave filling, just as their stomachs crave filling, when the filling the mind craves tends toward his knowledge. Men and women need uh, peace, uh, a civil society in which there's peace. Because? Uh, th that peace uh, provides them with the conditions of life that they need in order to pursue happiness. You don't mention, when you talk about the biological needs, you don't mention sex, and it seems to me that food is necessary for an individual to survive, but sex is necessary for the race to survive, and therefore, sex is as important to the race as food is well, to the individual. Sex is a very complex thing. Uh, you, since sex can take place without reproduction, without the reproduction of the race, we have to separate sex from reproduction. Uh, the question is whether or not the deprivation of sex I, I, I'm glad you mentioned it because one of the things I should have said was pleasure. All human beings need pleasure. Because? Because, because they are animals that suffer pleasure and pain, and pleasure is, is a fulfilling experience, and pain is a disturbing and dis distressing experience. Now, pleasures are of various kinds. There are the pleasures, ple pleasures of the flesh and the pleasures of the spirit. Uh, I would include sexual pleasure among the pleasures, but I don't think it's the only pleasure men need. They, they, they can't be deprived of pleasure and lead good lives. But I, I, I don't think, I, I kind of bring myself to think that a life of sexual deprivation is a life that is prevented from being a good one. But don't they need it because they are human and that the need for sex is as genetically coded as the need for food? No, I don't think so. Uh, the, evidence, the evidence in that, I would say, is that... Um, a man who starves dies. A man who doesn't sleep becomes so weak and emaciated that he, is, uh, his health is ruined and his health and vigor is lost. But does the deprivation of the particular fleshly pleasure that is sex uh, produce the same deteriorating or uh, destructive effects as the deprivation of food and sleep and drink? I, I, I just raise the question. It, it seems to me that for a man who deals in empirical evidence and logic, it is really quite arbitrary to say that all human beings everywhere at all time have certain basic needs 
and therefore they must desire ought to, to satisfy they, they ought to ought satisfy to, yeah. those needs in order to lead a good life i'm saying it because we are all members of the same species that means we all have the same fundamental potentialities those same fundamental potentialities are tendencies every potentiality tends to its own realization of fulfillment and the things i call the inherent natural desires or natural needs are our common human potentialities. If we were not social animals that have the potentiality of living with and associating with our fellow human beings, I would not say that such, a, such fellowship was a natural need. If we didn't have intellects that could know, I would not say that knowledge was a natural need. If we didn't have the power of free choice, I wouldn't say liberty of action was a natural need. If we didn't have uh, bodies and spirits that could be pleased and displeased, I wouldn't say pleasure was a natural need. In other words, I, I am looking at human beings and saying, here are five, six, or seven, not, not even a dozen, I would think, maybe nine or ten aspects or tendencies in human life that call for fulfillment, that tend toward fulfillment everywhere. Uh, and these are the, I would say, these natural needs are the common human aspirations. How did we get from a discussion of goodness to a discussion of needs? The question is, are there any prescriptive statements, statements to say, you ought to do this, you ought to seek that, that have truth. Now, it's, that's how we got to it. In our time, uh, moral philosophy has decided that no value judgments and no prescriptive oughts and ought nots are true or false because they're, they're, the theory of our contemporary philosophers about the truth is that all truth is descriptive. And if a statement isn't descriptive, it can't be true. Now, an ought statement is not descriptive. It is, it is prescriptive. Define prescriptive. It says ought. It, it's an injunction. It's a command. It, it, it's a direction of action with, with, an obli with a moral obligation. The word ought has a f full sense of moral obligation. You You're see. morally obligated to, to do, to eat. You're morally obligated to seek knowledge. You're morally ob obligated uh, to uh, uh, exercise p political liberty. Because these are essential to your human nature. What happens when we want more than we need, and what does that have to do with goodness? Let me give you a concrete example. I can easily imagine a, a parent saying to a child, you ought to seek as much schooling as you can get, not as little as you can get away with. And the child listening to it pays lip service to it and goes to college and stays in college. But while there, fritters away his time in various forms of play and, 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 and recreation, and above all, sleeps a great deal, sleeps uh, over the weekend and stays in bed late when he can, instead of getting, often cuts classes to do that. And because he, he indulges, indulges his, his desire for the pleasures of slumber. But you now, said sleep is necessary. Sleep is a good that we need, but we can often want more than the real good, more of the real good than we need it, see? Uh, a certain amount of sleep, just a certain amount of pleasure is, is a real good. But an immoderate, in an immoderate pursuit of pleasure is wanting more pleasure than you need. And wanting more of a good that you really need can often interfere with obtaining a good that you do need. For example, this student that we're talking about, who has, is not paying attention to his studies, who is not doing the work he should be doing in college because he's overindulging in pleasure, overindulging in eating, overindulging in drinking, overindulging in play, and in, in sleeping, is interfering with the use of his opportunity to increase the goods of his mind. So he's seeking the wants at the expense of his of need. That's precisely it. What, what, what are the practical applications of thinking about goodness? Of all the great ideas, the, the one that has the most obvious practical applications because our whole life is concerned with good and evil. Everything we do is uh, exercising choices, preferring this to that, preferring doing this to that, feeling the obligation to do this rather than that having remorse because one did the wrong thing. Life is, uh, I can't think of any moment of life in which good and evil doesn't obtrude upon us. We don't, we aren't aware of the fact that we're using those terms, but every action that we make is in terms of good and evil, right and wrong. How does one teach his children to have a respect for the right choice and to nurture that child into making the right choice? It's very hard. I've had a number of sons, two sets of them as a matter of fact, by two marriages, and in all four cases, two and two, I've tried to talk to them about the long-term future. I said, when you make a choice now between this and that, ask yourself which of the things you choose will work out best in the long run. 
But no one can know that. But let's go back to this student in college who was having a wonderful time playing around, having lots of fun, and indulging in a variety of pleasures which are evanescent, and sacrificing the goods of his mind by not studying. Now, what is the effect of that going to be upon him when he gets to be 30, 40, when his, when his, his skills are poor, when his knowledge is inadequate? He has wasted very precious years of his life because he didn't, didn't think about what's good for him in the long run. It's, I, I know, it's very hard for the young to think about their life. The thing that fascinates me is the time when you should think about your life as a whole is when you have your, your life as a whole before you. That's when you're young. Yet as you get older and older, you tend to be able to think more and better about your life as a whole when you have very little of it left. That's paradoxical, but true. If, the, if, you, could rever if, if you could reverse that, if older people, from their experience, could really persuade younger people how to think about their life as a whole, the history of the human race would be different. That, says Mortimer Adler, is why philosophy is everybody's business. We cannot think well about our lives without thinking hard about the great ideas conceived by the human race in our long search to know and understand. To talk about such ideas, he prefers a table of rich experience. These men and women are from labor, the law, physics, government, the academy, commerce. They come from America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. It isn't agreement Mortimer Adler expects from them. It's precision of language, precise thought about those ideas we act upon, liberty, equality, and justice, and those ideas we judge by, truth, beauty, and goodness. Words that name the great ideas, Adler insists, are all words of ordinary, everyday speech. They belong not to the private jargon of specialized knowledge, but to all of us. And just as in the case of descriptive truth, there is a distinction between what we do think from moment to moment and what we ought to think, if we wish to think truly rather than falsely. So there is a distinction between what we do actually desire from moment to moment and what we ought to desire if we, if we wish to desire what is really good for us and to avoid what is really bad for us. Those who say, and you all know the saying, that one's man, one man's meat is another man's poison are recognizing the subjective aspect if they say that's all there is to it. They are then taking the view that value judgments cannot be either true or false objectively and that there are no valid oughts in the sphere of human conduct. This seems to be the position, by the way, that Montaigne took in a little essay and echoed by Hamlet in Shakespeare's play. Montaigne said, there is nothing good or evil, but thinking makes it so. In other words, it's the individual judgment, and nothing but the individual judgment that confers goodness or badness on the object thought about, desired, or wanted. The question I want to ask you is, do you accept or reject Montaigne's position? When you look at cultures, individual acts are judged quite differently in different cultures. Mm -hmm. There is a sense in which, by thinking, we can call anything good or anything bad. That's, that's, that's Gus's Exactly, position. exactly. Yeah. Um, so that it, it is, in fact, from one point of view, true that there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so, because thinking in cultures, any value you find in one culture might not be a value but in Betty another Sue, culture. If you, were to, if you were to think well of my distinction between that which is merely apparently good because thinking makes it so, mm -hmm. and that which is really good no matter what you think, because, because of your innate, inherent, natural desires or need. I, mean, I said earlier that all men by nature desire to know we have a, a need for knowledge. Uh, that, uh, there, are some, there are some human beings who don't think they, don't th even make the mistake think they don't need it and avoid learning. They're wrong because they, are, they don't want what they need and what they need is really good for them. If they want wealth or power or something else, they want the wrong thing, not the right thing. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the point. Well, what are your difficulties with that? I, but, but, Mortimer, if I did, pardon me, Coco, just yes. let me make this point, because I, I think you're in danger of doing something that W.B. Yeats said, giving low explanations of high things. No. Yes, giving low explanations of say so. low things. Love to say so, no. <laughs> because I do not believe that the one, that the, your view of good is that it is good for us. It is instrumental for us. One of my concepts of goodness terrestrial goodness, not theological goodness, 
is goodness in itself and for itself. Virtue is its own reward. Mm. And I can't take I, I, this view you know, of I'm, terrestrial uh, life as being adequately covered by animal uh, life. I didn't Good say point. that. I didn't, oh, I didn't sure. say that. Okay. May, 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 may I stay with him? I'll come back to you in a moment. But I, I, I do have to defend myself against a misstatement here. I, I didn't Sorry. say that. Sorry. Uh, I was talking about uh, biologic, that terrestrial happiness was on a biological level. And I would like to say that I think you're wrong that virtue is its own reward. It is a good. Moral virtue is a good, but it's a means. It's a means, not an end. It's a means to happiness, either in this life or the next. Uh, it, it, in the next life, as it, when the end is the happiness in heaven, the, the souls that have the vision of God, the virtue is at a higher level, a heroic virtue, and the theological virtues are involved, not just the simple moral virtues. But let me get back to Coco. Uh, uh, I want to point out that uh, it is possible to look at, at, at the human person, uh, and some cultures do it, and some religions do it, as free from originals, the concept of original sin, no free that. from the fall from paradise, right. and so forth. It, it's immaterial in our discussion now. Yeah. The point I want to make is that it is uh, that uh, good and evil are not necessarily irreconcilable uh, uh, opposites. That um, uh, that uh, there are many cultures where uh, evil is accepted as an inevitable accompaniment of good. Well, I think that's true. Uh, where I think it's true uh, in man has had to learn to yes. live with uh, both the good and the evil in him. Mixtures with of the evil. brighter upper side right. and the darker underside right. of his being. I agree. It has also led to the dominance of another concern beyond the victory of the good over evil, and that is the maintenance of social harmony when survival of the tribe sure. or the family and so forth right. is at stake. Why is that relevant now? Because this lesson we all now have to learn. Yes. First, that it is not of the greatest importance that our truth is true. That there are multi multiple truths and that we will have to reconcile uh, those multiple truths at the point where our survival as the, hu for, as the human race and as civilized human beings with some transcendental perception of man that takes him beyond the animal level. I, I, becomes possible. You, you must. That is certainly the, must. That is the problem. You mustn't now. charge me. It isn't quite fair, Coco, to charge me with considering man at the animal level only. He begins there. He's an animal. He's a rational animal, and I think, in some no, okay, modest that's not the point. The, the point is the multiplicity of truths, of the various aspects of truth, and the need for us, all of us, to learn whatever the strength of our conviction of our own truth to give room to Look, the truth of others. May I make a comment on that, please? The deepest difference between East and West is on this very point. In the West, in one of the great disputations in the Middle Ages, St. Thomas defended against many opponents the doctrine of the unity of truth. And his point is, truth is a very complex whole, but all the parts of it must hang together. That unity, which embraces all truth, must include no conflicting truths. There, can't, there cannot be conflicting truths within the unity of truth. He did this in defense of the, of the Christian position against the Arab Averroes, who thought there were two truths, truth of religion on the one hand, truth of science on the other, and the left hand and the right hand didn't have to get together. For St. Thomas, there can be no conflict between science and religion. If there's truth of science and truth of religion, they must cohere and be consistent, otherwise there can't be parts of the unity of truth. Now, in the Eastern, as I, I may be wrong, but in the Eastern view of these matters, when you and other Easterners, if I may say so, uh, speak about the multiplicity of truths, you are willing to embrace in that multiplicity conflicting truths. I am not. And then I'm, not, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying for a moment who's right. I'm only saying this is as fundamental a difference sure. between the Far East and the West as like any I know. And I do think I have to say that one of, the, one of us is right and one of us is wrong, but which, which I will not know. No, 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 because the, the conflict that you see may be a product of your mind. Uh, Maybe uh, the... Uh, oh, I've got is my mind the, to work with. Well, yeah, exactly. The, That's all you've got. We, we, no, we put, there are cultures that put different uh, value or uh, different f f value 
on the capacity of reason to uh, comprehend truth. Uh, there are other ways of uh, directly relating to reality, including absolute morality, uh, uh, reality, through the artistic eye, through the through the mystic, yeah, through I, the religious experience, I, and so forth. I, I, now, I can see as a that. result, as a result, in many of the of the of the non-Western civilizations, people have felt no need to be consist to to construct uh, uh, to, to to develop a construct of the mind that is that has an inner coherence and inner logic. Say, uh, is, uh, so that is to say, uh, that may not be the problem. The problem may be a false issue. The real problem now is can we develop a new consensus, moral consensus on a global scale and on a transgenerational scale that will allow our children and grandchildren to live as decent human beings. I share your hope. Mm -hmm. uh, How can one be so presumptuous as to make judgments about what is good for other people in other cultures that are not Western? The only way that one can make those judgments on the philosophical level because I, I have to be quite open about the diversity of religious beliefs and the diversity of things that go beyond the natural plane. Uh, the hereafter, the, the, the obligations of one's life uh, that are, come from transcendental sources, not the sources of our nature. Uh, the presumption, I think, is minimized by the fact that it, it relies upon the common nature that all of us share. You mean what we all are as, as human humans. beings? Yeah. That, that being example, human goes beyond being Western. I, I can't, if I say slavery is universally bad, the life of the free man is universally good for man. I, I don't apologize for that. If that's a Western idea, it's a, I say it's a human idea. It applies to all human beings everywhere. And any Eastern civilization, or any civilization anywhere that denies that, I think is wrong. And I don't hesitate to say that other civilizations are wrong. But that brings us back to the beginning of the circle, which is who is to decide what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. Our problem is to find out what is really good for every human being. How do we find that out? I say we can, there's no way of finding it out except by looking to human nature. If, if, if I abandon the notion of human nature, if I abandon the notion that human nature is the same wherever, wherever men are, that it's, it's the common constant throughout the human life, the human life on earth, I have no basis for moral judgments at all. I want to be perfectly clear with you. If I give up the notion of human nature and natural needs, I have no basis whatsoever for any universally valid moral judgment. What about human rights? Because many societies do not accept, as Jimmy Carter learned, uh, our definition of see, human I, rights. I, I, I may say so. Uh, I think the, the only word that you use there that I would quarrel with is our definition. The definition of human rights is identical with the definition of human needs. Everything that any human being needs, he has a right to. And I'll put it another way. Anything that a human being needs as a condition of his leading a good life, he has a right to. Which is more important by your philosophy? To know what is good to have or to know what is right to do? What is right to do? In a sense, something I've just said implicitly answers your question. I don't think we can ever know what is right or wrong in our conduct to others unless we know what is really good for ourselves to have. It's only by my knowing that freedom is real good for me that I know that slavery is wronging somebody else. It's only that when I know that having a moderate supply of external goods is a real good for me as a condition of a good life that I know that grinding poverty and destitution is wrong for others. They have a right to a minimum, at least a decent minimum of wealth. Only when I know what is really good for me, that I should pursue, I ought to pursue, do I know what is right for everybody else to have, and I'm obligated to do my best I can to act justly toward them. And is this knowledge the work of philosophy? It seems to me this is what moral philosophy is about. I come from a culture in which many peoples do not see the polarity of good and evil which we're discussing here, in which good is synonymous with the word beautiful, and evil is not the opposite of good. I don't understand the need to relate innate needs to a dualistic moral system of good and evil. But I believe that uh, good and evil as a concept is a Western concept that it does not apply to certain primal people and tribal people. 
uh, who make distinctions which are not made, uh, made by the Western world. For instance, it is terribly difficult to explain to the Inuit people that in this society there are professionals who are trained and paid to kill other people, both executioners and organized armies. On the other hand, this culture finds it terribly difficult to understand that in other societies, cannibalism and human sacrifice is practiced as a good. I'm trying to suggest that perhaps good is not the opposite of evil, and that there is nothing that relates innate human needs to the concept of good. Curiously enough, what you said uh, still reflects something that Montaigne had in mind. Montaigne is one of the first writers in the Western tribe, if you will, or the Western civilization, who wrote an essay in defense of cannibalism. My, uh, living uh, in the 16th century, Montaigne uh, was extraordinarily learned about the variety of tribal mores. I use the word tribal in no pejorative sense. And found all of them tolerable, however radically they differed, you see. And it's that which I think he's trying to defend when he says that anything that a particular people or a particular individual thinks well of it, he regards as good, and that's no other way of well, talking about it. Well, that's why I voted. In, yeah. in that, yeah. But you understand, I mean, without going at, elaborating beyond the time permits, yeah. the discussion is unconsciously, but perpetually based on the Western presumption. I, I'm afraid it is. Right. And, and that, that is perfectly understandable, sure. since we are sure. dealing and essentially... your minority voice at this point is well heard. I could quote, quote Carl Jung, who says, any system of philosophy or psychology which is a leveling influence he is opposed yeah. to. And I feel that somehow or another in the discussion of good and evil, which is of course familiar to us since um, it was a major ploy of all missionaries, um, that there is a tendency to unconsciously silence dissent. And I am um, uh, provoked to, to uh, address myself to an issue, even if my opinion has been effectively silenced by the question I've been I asked. May I, ask I, I just ask you, Vapke, if dissent is a Western concept too? Uh, yes, it is. You're yeah, absolutely right. right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I'd like to ask you your definition of goodness or good. Well, because well, I understand you. Let me make it a personal definition because one can never speak of Indians any more than one can speak of Europeans. Right. There are a great many different people, right. a great many different mentalities, right. and what have you. But speaking personally, I would relate it to my own tribal background in which goodness is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And since in the life of my people, the aesthetic, is the ultimate effervescence of life, and all things are judged by that, that, that notion, then it is a kind of, quote, moral code, but it has none of the dualistic we notion. Will, we will come, by the way, it is, it is a word which is ugly, too. Yes. yes. And uh, the opposition of beautiful and ugly is something like as dualistic as good and evil. Now, uh, uh, may I say also that uh, I'm sure you know that I disagree with you. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> that I will try to defend a position which I think is not simply Western, but human, and applies to any tribe of human beings anywhere. It seems to me that basic needs, and particularly as now defined, take us back to such a basic level at a time when it seems to me that the accumulative experience of mankind has been not only taking basic needs for granted, but building on them. So that if we were to take this into, for instance, the real world we live in, and people say, well, you know, there are some people who really suffer and who, need, who have basic needs, I would say that over the period of experience, man has learned to emphasize different things, to, uh, to develop his capacity and potential in areas that he has chosen for one reason or another from his experience to be the things he wants to develop. So that, for instance, in my part of the world, men might have developed more the art and the science of dealing with one another as human beings I that. and certain moral values. That's and nature might have provided certain basic needs that they don't even have to think about anymore. Granted, but the now, point... Then, a, if we say part of the world needs basic things, they need food, they need clothing, they need this, they need that, and we go about trying to provide that, we satisfy ourselves in terms of the higher goals of pursuing greater values of men. But, but stay on the lowest level for a moment. going to that level of basic needs. Francis, stay on the level, lowest level for a moment. When we talk about human rights, which I can't understand except in terms of these basic needs, why do we, why 
do we regard, I think, in the doc all doctrines of human rights, enslavement as a wrong treatment of man? I say because man by nature needs freedom. I would be inspired by the overriding goal of human dignity. Yes, I would to too. To pursue human rights rather than the, by the basic need to be free. But, 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 but if you ask what the particular rights are, see, uh, human dignity is certainly the uh, essential component of the whole picture. But if you say, what are the rights, the deprivation of which must be corrected? Well, for example, uh, just taking our own country, I think we take serious, we took seriously in, within our recent past, the war on poverty. And what we meant by the war on poverty is that a small portion of our population, really a small fraction, are seriously deprived of these basic biological goods. They live below the human standard with respect to nutrition, with respect to food, with respect to uh, the simple e basic economic goods. We regard that as a violation of their human rights. And if it is, it's because they, are, they, they have a fundamental need that is not being answered. They are suffering serious deprivation. And when we talk about the, the, uh, the uh, economies in the world, where large numbers of people are ill, undernourished and illiterate, uh, given no form of, 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 of education at all, we regard that as a violation of human rights. And again, I say the violation is based upon common basic human needs. The fact that they are fundamental and that we must, that doing them is not enough, you see. Uh, I agree with you entirely that you have to go beyond them in many ways. Uh, there are many things that uh, are good for human individuals that they are privileged, privileged, privileged to pursue, but always on the basis of a basic needs being follow, uh, satisfied first. Yes, Rudy. Very briefly, uh, Mortimer, we had a discussion in the United Nations over the last several uh, years, no. yes. uh, starting from human rights leading to basic human needs. Yeah. And as you said, one was building on the other. Right. Uh, however, the basic needs as defined in UN papers, and I'm sure Coco will uh, back me up on that, is somewhat different in areas entirely different from what we've been discussing. I, I, there is food, mm -hmm. there's health care, there's education, but there's also energy. There's also industrialization you, you know, and a number of other basic needs that may I call your attention think really? that they are basic. See, in that, I really think it's very important to make the distinction that I tried to make between what are the basic needs that correspond to the small number of potentialities in human nature and what are all energy, for instance, and a healthy environment. Mm -hmm. These are instrumental means, instrumental means needed, of course, because the needed is means to achieve the ultimate goods which correspond to the natural needs. In other words, there are two levels of, there are two steps in analysis there. May I hold this a moment, Coco? I'll come to you in a second. Uh, I, I, I want to make one point, and I want to stop and uh, ask Coco to speak. But what has interested me about this whole discussion is I started out this morning by saying I thought there was a way of making a small number of ought and ought not judgments true. And nothing that's been said so far has illuminated me about how that can be done. Coco? I think uh, very little purpose is served in trying to enumerate what are these human rights uh, and what are basic and, and uh, what are not basic. Um, in terms of our, uh, there is a much more fundamental problem with the human rights issue, and that is uh, what do you do with human rights in societies and in cultures which do not define themselves and do not look at themselves in terms of rights, but in terms of mutual obligations, where life is defined in terms of the mutuality of obligations, and where rights are not explicitly stated. The denial of our own needs is a major goodness for in particular cases. There are millions of mothers in this world who deprive themselves of food in order to enhance very marginally the chances of their babies to survive. There are many such, such things that are going on in peace, in war, and in the destitution that is the, the, the condition of the majority of mankind. Now, to exclude those elements of the self-denial from our discussion of goodness only shows the, the inadequacy of the context within which we discuss goodness. Let me, well, doesn't that illustrate a very important thing? Does it? You, it does you, indeed. You, you listed these basic needs, and you had defined basic needs, I thought, as those that 
we could confidently say man ought, right. ought to pursue. Right. And now we've been given an example, and, and, and I must say a very poignant one. Indeed. Where the basic needs, food on the one hand, love on the other, if you choose to call it that, appear to conflict. There's no question about and it. And so the person made a choice. All I want to say is they weren't able to make that choice by consulting your list no. of which needs were basic, you, because when they did that, they found them both listed. You're quite correct. In fact, may I say, the essence of tragedy is the difficult choice between conflicting goods. When, when shall I say, the, the impulse, the perfectly proper in, impulse towards self-preservation, toward the good of one's own preservation in life, conflicts with the love one bears one's children or one's friend, you've got a conflict of goods. And Lord, human life is not that simple, you see. That doesn't change the picture, what, what needs are, what rights are, what, it merely means that human, the, 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 I would almost like to put it this way, the human pursuit of happiness, I still say on earth, is a tragic undertaking, because it's always, always carries the burden of tragic, we are compelled to choose, and sometimes we're faced with choices where we are choosing between good and evil. We're seldom faced with choices between good, pure good, and pure evil. As you said, most of the cases are mixed, and when they, when they get to the center, and the mixture is very difficult to balance, as much, what, which is the least evil, which is the more, more good, human beings are often forced to take evil under themselves, forced to take evil under themselves by having to make a choice for the opposite good. Someone said this morning, when we have to decide this is good and that is good, but we must make a choice, we're in trouble. No, the, what about the choice between no, two I, goods? No, I don't think we're in trouble when we choose between... When, when both goods uh, are, do involve no admixtures of evil. The trouble is, the trouble we have is that, and this is the essence of tragedy, that in many cases, the thing we're looking at is mixed. A test of the good is an evil. To obtain that good, we have to also embrace a certain evil. Let, let, for, let, let me take these, let's take the, I think the difficult human case of divorce. Mm. I think anyone who gets a divorce has embraced a certain amount of evil. I'm not saying divorce is bad, but uh, I don't think div uh, uh, divorce is an easy thing to do. You've done it. I've done it, and I think I've always suffered from the, the aspect of evil that's attached to the good I wanted. Uh, and, and, and the difficult choices in life are those where the admixture of good and evil is such that no matter which way you, no matter which way you choose, you do embrace evil in getting the good you want. Uh, it'd be nice if that weren't so. Let's, let's take Antigone for a moment. Mm. That great marvelous tragedy, isn't it? Yes. Uh, she wants uh, to, act, to perform the pious act of burying her brother. She doesn't want to die. She doesn't want to be punished. She doesn't want to be buried alive in the cave. Uh, yet, uh, she, does, she, she doesn't want to live, though that's a good, and sacrifice her filial piety to, uh, shall I say, uh, realize the filial piety. She has to take unto herself a real evil, the evil of death. See if you can make an application to this, one of the hottest issues in our society, abortion. An unmarried woman, without any means of support, becomes pregnant. She must choose between having a child she cannot Support. feed, clothe, or shelter, or having an abortion which many people consider to be murder. How does she make that choice? How do you help her make that choice? I don't think I know how to help her make that choice. Then uh, is all of this irrelevant? No, no. To no, her? No, no, because the fact that all the moral wisdom we have does not enable us to be clear and decisive about a difficult choice. Otherwise, it'd be no if it were easy to make that choice. If one could say, clearly, I can show you reasons why you must choose this rather than that, it wouldn't be tragic. I say tragedy comes in when you're tempted to go this way and that way, and either way you go, no abortion, the consequences are very serious for her, aren't they? Abortion, the consequences are serious for her. You're saying that life is tragic. I'm saying that I, what I really would like to say here in the most general sense is the human pursuit of happiness is overlaid with tragedy. You've just used a term that I haven't heard you use today, the pursuit of happiness. What does the pursuit of happiness have to do with a discussion of goodness? Happiness is the ultimate good, the ultimate and common good of every human being. 
But that depends on how you define happiness. I, I, Jefferson's use of that phrase is one of those remarkable introductions of a, an idea into history. When he said, among these rights are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, one wonders what he meant by the pursuit of happiness. Now, you think about it, there are only two things he could have meant by that term. In fact, only two things ever meant by it, because happiness is always an ultimate end. You, you never seek happiness because you want something else. You want everything in order to be happy. I can't imagine anyone concluding the sentence, I want to be happy because. I want wealth because I want to be happy. I want friends because I want to be happy. I want love because I want to be happy. I want health because I want to be happy. But I want to be happy because nothing. What it about is... saying I want friends because I want friends? No. No, friendship is a, uh, friends are a good that makes a good life. Whatever, whatever completes, whatever contributes to one's happiness, one wants because one wants to be happy. But you can't say you want to be happy for any other reason beyond it. Take that, take that for a moment. Regard happiness as a word that always names the ultimate end we seek, the ultimate good, the, the final end, that which we seek for its own sake and not for the sake of anything else. Now, if that's the case, there are two meanings. One is the psychological meaning, in which happiness means a state of contentment. A man is happy when he, gets every, when he has everything he wants. And some days he may be happy, and some weeks he may be happy, and some years he may be happy, be followed by an unhappy year because at various times he has what he wants, and sometimes he's frustrated in getting what he wants. The other meaning of happiness is a man is happy if in the course of his whole lifetime he obtains everything he needs, not wants, but needs, that he ought to have. Now, I think it is clear that Jefferson must have meant by the pursuit of happiness that a man uh, in the pursuit of happiness obtains everything that is really good for him, everything that he needs, not everything that he wants. Because if a government uh, undertakes to secure for everyone the conditions of the pursuit of happiness, and men want different things that bring them into conflict, no government can do that. Uh, I men in pursuit of their needs do not come into conflict. They can work cooperatively to satisfy their needs. But if, let's say, here are some men, both of whom want, want power over everybody else. Like, that can't be satisfied. That wrong want, I think. But nevertheless, they want it, and they're dis discontented or unhappy in their terms of the word happy if they can't get it, but they both can't be secure in, the, in, the, in getting that want. So I think Jefferson must have understood Aristotle's conception of happiness as, the, as a good life as a whole, made good, enriched by the possession of everything that one really needs, plus a lot of other goods that are innocuous because they don't interfere with what you really need. Uh, St. Augustine, whom I referred to before, has a marvelous single sentence in a little, little essay on happiness. He said, happy is the man who in the course of a whole lifetime has everything he desires, provided he desire nothing amiss. That proviso is simply wonderful. Everything he desires, provided he desires nothing amiss. Let me translate. Augustine is saying, happy is the man who in the course of a whole lifetime obtains everything that he ought to desire and nothing that he ought not to desire. If, if we would clarify the matter, I'm going to be able for the moment and say the ultimate end that we all should see is a totally good life. It's an end we can't ever reach. The, the end of our life we, we reach is death. Of the last moments of our life are dying moments. Our life as a whole is like a symphony being played. It exists at no one moment. The conductor who tries to give an excellent performance of that symphony never has it at any moment. He has it only when the whole is completed. So a good life is something you have only when the whole is completed. And yet there are moments in any symphony oh, of epiphany, oh, sure. of there are moments joy, of... of... Oh, no, now using the right, the delight, contentment, enthusiasm, ecstasy. Those are all psychological words, and I'm using the word happiness in a non-psychological, purely moral sense. I don't see how your definition of happiness, using your own words, helps the common man or woman make sense of life I because don't. of the risks of chance, which mean I, that life may not wind up, for reasons beyond I, his or her control, I, I, a good life. Accepting my view for a moment, just for the moment, All right. that happiness consists in a good life well lived. He said, well, what, what's involved in that pursuit? I'd say there are two things involved in it, two causes, two factors, each of which is necessary but neither of which is sufficient by itself. One is moral virtue. Moral virtue consisting in a habitual dis disposition to make the right choices. Take Augustine's point, never desiring anything amiss, never desiring what you ought not to desire, or failing to desire what you ought to desire. 
Moral virtue is an indispensable condition of leading a good life, of making a good life for yourself. But the other thing you've just mentioned is equally important. Good fortune, things beyond your control. Uh, you have some power over your health, some power over your wealth, some power over the kind of society you live in, but not complete. You can suffer the accidents, outrageous accidents of misfortune. And your life can be ruined beyond your free choices by misfortunes. So we come, don't we, to politics, which has as its purpose trying to create the conditions in which people can pursue Precisely. a good life. Precisely. The reason why I object to a large number of moral philosophers who think that being virtuous is, is sufficient. If a man is virtuous, it makes no difference what f misfortunes he suffers. To take that view is to say, like, as Epictetus said, I, even though I'm a slave and my master's broken my leg, it makes no difference, my will is good, I'm a virtuous man, and I'm living a good life. I say no. The life of a slave is not the life of a good man. The life of uh, a person whose limbs have been maimed is not a good life. A uh, life of a person who has been, shall I say, deprived of health, deprived of a, of a healthy environment is not a good life. If, if, if virtue alone were sufficient for good life, we would have none of the moral, none of the political economic reforms that have seen the progress of the human race. We would not pursue a society of liberty, Precisely. equality, and justice. Precisely. A good society is one which confers upon all its individuals the conditions of a good life by providing them with the goods of fortune beyond their control. You, you know, look, if you, if you are under the obligation to make a good life for yourself, you have a right to anything you need to do so. The right is rest on that need to fulfill the obligation that's imposed upon you. If you have a moral obligation to lead a good life and you need certain things to do so, you have a right to those things. Let me say it another way. When you know in your own heart and soul what is really good for you as the conditions of leading a good life, you also know what every other human being has a right to. You can't say, this, these are things that are really good for me and no one else has a right to them. Anything you recognize is really good for you, you also know at once is right for everybody else to have and they have a right to claim it. Mortimer Adler, next in this series, The Idea is Liberty. I'm Bill Moyers.